questions people have when they begin to study the Bible from a historical perspective is, how did we get the Bible? Uh, in particular, who chose which books go into the Scriptures, which we call the canon of Scripture, and which books were not included in the Scripture? Uh, one of the reasons this is particularly pressing for the Old Testament, as you may know, is because there are different canons or different collections of Scriptures for the Old Testament. So, for example, uh, the Catholic Old Testament has 46 books in it. Uh, the Protestant Old Testament has 39 books in it. And the Jewish scriptures, known as the Tanakh, has 24 books, which are actually the same books as in the Protestant, but they're, they're just numbered differently. So either 24 or 39, it's the same basic canon, but the books are in a different order uh, and they're counted differently. So the question is, which of these Bibles is the actual Old Testament? And um, one of the ways people try to answer that is by saying, well, what was the Bible that Jesus used when he was alive? In other words, what was the ancient Jewish canon of Scripture? How did it come to be? And if you pick up a Bible dictionary or maybe you read articles online about how the canon of the Old Testament was closed, how it was officially decided upon, you will frequently encounter the idea that the canon of the Old Testament, the canon of the Jewish Scriptures, was closed at the so-called Council of Jamnia, which is supposedly uh, reported as having taken place in 90 AD. Right? So according to this idea, um, after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, a number of the rabbis got together at Yavna in the land of Israel, um, which is sometimes called Jamnia, and, um, and there they had a council in which they decided which books would be in considered Jewish scripture and which books were rejected as apocrypha or non-canonical books. And that that was essentially the formation of the Jewish Bible, which uh, carries on to this day in Jewish circles and which was inherited by Protestant Christians as well, uh, slightly different order, but the same books, 39 books of scripture. Uh, so what I'd like to do and look at in this video is basically to show that that common idea, it's very widespread, that the Jewish scriptures were canonized at the Council of Jamnia is quite simply a myth. It's not true. It never happened. So I want to walk you through some of the evidence, just in brief, uh, and show you about uh, the myth of the Council of Jamnia. Okay? So uh, we'll begin by looking at the state of the Jewish scriptures in the first century AD. Um, the first point we want to make is this. The Bible as we know it did not exist at the time of Jesus, uh, in, the, in the sense that there was not a closed collection of scriptures known as the Bible. There was not a definitive decision of exactly which books went into the scripture and which books were not in. What you had, rather, were collections of writings that were considered to be scripture by the Jews, but the exact parameters of which were still being debated. You can actually see this if you look in the Gospels, for example, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 5, verse 17 uh, of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Right? Matthew 5, 17. There, Jesus is referring to the standard Jewish names for the first two parts of the Old Testament. The books of the law namely the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and then the books known as the Prophets, which consisted both of books like Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, as well as, actually Samuel and Kings, and as well as books like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and whatnot. Okay, so Jesus there reflects the fact that there were two major partitions to the Jewish scriptures as they were developing. First, part one, the law. Second, part two, the Prophets. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke, we see something similar, but with a little extra detail. We see a third part of the Scriptures. In Luke 24, uh, verse 44, Jesus says this, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Okay. We'll pause there. This is one of the earliest references to the tripartite structure of the Jewish scriptures. So at the time of the Gospel of Luke, what this is reflecting, reflecting is that the Jews had three collections of holy writings. First, the law, the Pentateuch. Second, the prophets. And then third, the group known as the writings, right? 
which consisted of psalms, and proverbs, wisdom literature, and things like that, but which Jesus here simply refers to as the psalms because it's the heading of the, of the third portion of the Jewish scriptures. These three parts, the law, the prophets, and the writings, would eventually go on to be the form and the content of what we now know today as the Jewish Bible. But we can already see here that Jesus doesn't give a list of scriptures. And in fact, the third part, the writings, is still being formed, is still being decided, so much that Jesus can refer to that first part simply as the Psalms, the first part of the, of the writings. Okay. Now, these are just hints of the state of the scriptures at the time of Jesus. We know from other sources, like the writing of Josephus, that there were actually um, commonly held beliefs about which books should be considered scripture and which shouldn't. So I'm going to give you an example here. This is from Josephus, famous Jewish historian, his uh, writing called Against Apian. And in book one of Against Apian, Josephus says this, it follows that we, meaning the Jews, do not possess myriads of inconsistent books conflicting with one another. Our books, which are thus justly accredited, are but two and twenty and contain the record of all time. So here, Je uh, sorry, <laughs> Josephus reflects the idea that for many Jews, and Josephus claims to have followed the Pharisees' view, there were 22 books in the Bible. Notice that that's two less than the contemporary Jewish scriptures. They count as 24, right? And sure enough, Josephus there reflects the fact that the Bible was stable, but not yet completely defined. Because other writings uh, give us other lists. So I can't go into all the sources right now, but we know from other sources that, for example, the Sadducees, a very important group in first century Judaism, only accepted the five books of Moses. Josephus tells us the Pharisees here uh, that he reflects accepted 22 books, um, another writing known as 4th Ezra, uh, which is not in the Bible, um, talks about 94 sacred books being divided into 24 public books, probably referring to the books of the Jewish scriptures, and then 70 secret books, which are also considered to be divinely revealed. So that's 94 books. And then there's, of course, uh, collections like the Essenes, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we don't know exactly what books they considered to be scripture or how many books they would have in what we would, might call a canon. So, all that to say this, the upshot is simple. At the end of the first century AD, there isn't any closed canon of scripture. In other words, there's not one single list of officially accepted books that all Jews agreed on, right? Some Jews take the law and the prophets, some just the law, some the law, the prophets, and the writings. Some think it's 22 books, some think it's 24, some think it's 94. So, you got all, and some have other views that we don't even know exactly which books they consider to be scripture. So, in the first century AD, the canon of what we call the Old Testament is not closed. It's still in flux. It's still developing. All right. Now, onto the scene then steps the idea that that canon that was being debated was closed by the rabbis in 90 AD at this Council of Jamnia. Now, if you look for references to the Council of Jamnia in the writings of the Church Fathers or the writings uh, of the medieval writers, you're not, you're not going to find it. Because the Council of Jamnia was first proposed as a theory uh, in the 19th century by a German Jewish scholar named Heinrich Gretz. He wrote a book on the history of the Jews, and he was the one to first propose the idea that the Jewish canon of Scripture had been closed by the rabbis at a synod or council at Jamnia in 90 AD. And he also claimed that not only did they close the canon, but they also rejected certain books as apocrypha, things like the book of Sirach, for example, which is in the Catholic Old Testament, or Maccabees. Um, now, this theory by Heinrich Graetz got picked up in English-speaking scholarship, especially by an English scholar, a Protestant named H.E. Ryle, R-Y-L-E. And he really spread the theory of Jamnia into the English-speaking world. Uh, he went a little further than Gretz, and he said, had this to say about uh, Jamnia. Now, I'm, I'm going to quote him exactly here because I want to hear what he says. Uh, in his very popular book on the canon of the Old Testament, Rao wrote this. Rao writes, quote, Now we happen to know that a council of Jewish rabbis would held at Jamnia, Gavna, not very far from Jaffa, around the year 90 AD. We have in the Synod of Jamnia the official occasion on which the limits of the Hebrew canon 
were firmly determined by Jewish authorities. Right? End quote. So we see there, uh, Ryle is very strong in arguing that the Old Testament canon was officially closed by a council of Jewish rabbis held in the southern part of Israel at Jamnia in 90 AD. And that is, in a sense, the origin of the Old Testament. Um, and again, this ideal of Ryle gets popularized uh, by other studies of the canon, like Albert Sundberg's book, uh, until it basically becomes a kind of common knowledge, a common assertion that, well, everybody knows the Jewish Bible and the Old Testament, uh, therefore the canon of the Old Testament was closed in 90 AD. I might note, by the way, that although it was originally proposed by Gretz, who was a, a Jewish scholar, this theory was picked up by Protestant Christian scholars and used by them often as a justification for accepting the shorter canon of the Old Testament held by Protestants, right? So remember, there's a difference here. Catholics have a longer canon of 46 books in the Old Testament. Protestants have 39 books, which, although different in number, are identical in content to the Jewish scriptures, which they count as 24. I know it's a little confusing, but uh, just put it this way. The, the Protestant and Jewish Bibles are the same in content, just not in organization. So Protestant scholars picked up on the theory of Jamnia in order to argue, hey, our Old Testament, the shorter Old Testament, goes back to the first century AD. It's rooted in Jewish authority in a Jewish council, and it goes back almost to the time of Christ. And that's what I believed uh, myself for a long time as I began to study uh, the development of Scripture and the origins of the Bible and the development of canon when I was an undergraduate. Until I started digging into the actual evidence for Jamni itself, and I began to learn about the rabbis, and I began to learn Hebrew, and to study uh, the writings of Jewish, uh, uh, ancient Jewish writers such as the Dead Sea Scrolls and whatnot, I began to look for the actual evidence for Jamnia. And one of the things I discovered on my, on my own, before I realized that scholars had discovered it before me, was that there really is no evidence for a council of Jamnia happening in 90 AD. That Gretz basically uh, made the theory up almost, almost out of thin air. So let me give you the evidence. There is one piece of evidence, and I'm putting evidence in quotes here, uh, that Gretz and then later Ryle and others based the theory of the council on. It's a text from the Mishnah. I've got a copy of the Mishnah here. It's one of my favorite books to read. The Mishnah is a collection of ancient Jewish traditions, ancient Jewish traditions of the rabbis. Uh, not, this is not in the scriptures. This is from after the time of the, uh, the scriptures, um, around the first century BC, all the way up to around 200 AD when the Mishnah was canonized. It's a collection of oral traditions that were put down in written form uh, at the turn of the third century. And it tells us what the different rabbis and schools of thought were teaching and saying over the course of the three centuries uh, previous to its, its uh, being written down. And in one of the treatises in the Mishnah, known as Yadayim, which means hands, there is a discussion about canonical books of Scripture. And this is the text that Gretz based his theory of the Council of Jamnia on. So I'm going to read it to you. It's a little bit long, um, but I want to give you the actual evidence so you can see for yourself uh, what the theory of Jamnia was based on and whether the evidence supports the theory. So this is the, this is the text from the Mishnah. And it is describing a debate about the canonicity of two books, the Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes. And I'm going to preface it by saying this. Uh, the rabbis use this, uh, an expression uh, to describe a book as canonical. Um, they say that it renders the hands unclean. Okay, now, That might be a counterintuitive way to think about it. But what they mean is that the book communicates holiness to anyone who touches it. Okay. Um, and that's their way of saying a book is scripture or not. If a book renders the hands unclean, it has the power to communicate holiness, and it is scripture. If it doesn't render the hands unclean, then it's just an ordinary book. Now, I know you would think it would be the opposite, but I don't have time to go into it right now. That's the, that's the symbolism of the meaning. So listen to this. This is from Mishnah Yadayim 3, verse 5, and I'm quoting Herbert Danby's translation. The Mishnah states, all the holy scriptures render the hands unclean. The Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes render the hands unclean. Rabbi Judah says, The Song of Songs renders the hands unclean, but about Ecclesiastes there is dissension. Rabbi Yosa says, Ecclesiastes does not render the hands unclean, 
and about the Song of Songs there is dissension. Rabbi Simeon says, Ecclesiastes is one of the things about which the school of Shammai, that's one of the famous rabbis, adopted the more lenient, and the school of Hillel, another famous rabbi, the more stringent ruling. Rabbi Simeon ben Azai said, I have heard a tradition from the 72 elders on the day when they made Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah head of the college that the Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes both render the hands unclean. Rabbi Akiva said, God forbid. No man in Israel ever disputed about the Song of Songs, that it does not render the hands unclean. For all the ages are not worth the day on which the Song of Songs was given to Israel. For all the writings are holy, but the Song of Songs is the holy of holies. And if aught was in dispute, the dispute was about Ecclesiastes alone. Rabbi Yochanan ben Yahshua, the son of Rabbi Akiva's father-in-law, said, According to the words of ben Aze, so did they dispute, and so did they decide. Mishnah Yadaim 3.5. All right, so that's the evidence. Did you see the Council of Jamnia in there? I sure didn't. So how does this text form the basis for a theory of a council? I mean, you'll notice it didn't even mention Jamnia, right? Much less uh, a council or a final decision about which books were scripture or any rejection of the Apocrypha or any of those other things. So how do you get Jamnia out of this? Well, let's look at what the text says, and then we'll talk about what it doesn't say in a second. First, clearly this is recording a debate among the rabbis about whether two books were inspired or not, the Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes. Now, you'll notice from the text, if anything, if it shows anything, it doesn't show unity, it shows dissension about the scriptural status of these books. On the one hand, some rabbis clearly thought that Ecclesiastes was not scripture. Why might they think that? Well, we don't know for sure, but if you've ever read Ecclesiastes, you'll know. It's very cynical. It's very negative. You know, all is vanity, vanity of vanities. It, it has a very kind of almost despairing quality to it, which might have given pause to some rabbis to think, is this really scripture, right? Uh, the other, on the other hand, some rabbis are saying the Song of Songs is not scripture. It's not uh, inspired. Uh, why might someone say that? Well, if you ever read the Song of Songs, again, you might notice the Song of Songs is a very, at, at first glance, it's a very erotic poem. And it might make you think at first glance, what is this doing in the Bible? <laughs> How did this uh, erotic poem, this love poem, make it into the scriptures? So there were some rabbis who said, mm, this isn't uh, scripture. So there was debate about these two texts. And what we see in this a particular passage from the Mishnah is basically a record of who took what side and who had what views about the uh, books of Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs, about whether or not they were scripture. And it does seem to suggest at the end of it that Rabbi Akiva's father-in-law had a memory of Ben Aze and some other group taking the position, the kind of final position, that Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs were in fact scripture, despite the debates about them. That's all it says. But notice what's missing from this passage. Number one, no reference to Jamnia or to uh, a council taking place there. Number two, no clear evidence that any such council happened in 90 AD. Number three, no clear evidence that there was any discussion of any other books in what we consider today to be the Old Testament or the Jewish scriptures. Number four, no rejection of so-called apocrypha like Sirach or Maccabees or these other books as not being scriptural. They're not even mentioned in this text, right? And it's precisely these absences that led scholars in the wake of the popularization of this theory to begin questioning it. Uh, so, for example, I'm just going to give a couple of quick views. This is certainly not just my idea, but I want to make uh, some, some allusions here to scholars who pointed this out. In the 1960s, uh, a Protestant scholar, Jack Lewis, um, wrote an article questioning the, the, the existence and the, uh, the theory of Jam, Jamnia as being an actual council. He was one of the first people to say, look, the evidence really does not support this theory. Uh, this... Uh, Lewis's perspective was picked up by Raymond Brown, very famous Catholic biblical scholar, who in 1968 is already pointing out 
There's no list of books being drawn up. There's no evidence for a discussion of anything other than Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs in the so-called Council of Jamnia texts. Um, arguments about books, which books were scripture and which books not weren't actually persisted for decades after 90 AD, if you look at later rabbinic literature, and there's no record of any books being rejected at uh, Jamnia in this so-called Jamnia text. So Raymond Brown uh, was critical of this all the way back in the 60s, and other scholars since then, like Joseph Blinkensop and David Aune, both of whom were my teachers at the University of Notre Dame, went on to write articles in the 70s as well as into the 90s, basically using the language of myth, arguing, as David uh, Aune wrote, that the Council of Jamnia was nothing less than a myth. Uh, Blinkensop called it, quote, a myth of Christian scholarship without documentary foundation. Um, and that's basically correct. Uh, there is simply no data, there's no evidence to suggest that there ever was any kind of council, like the Council of Nicaea or the Council of Hippo or Carthage, or the early Christian councils. There was no council of Jews, of rabbis in 90 AD at Jamnia that came to any final or definitive decision about the canon of the Jewish scriptures. Um, and if you want proof for this, uh, you can simply look at the fact, uh, actually, I should put it this way. If you want proof for this, you can look at the Jewish writings of the rabbis themselves. Because if you don't just stop with the Misha, but continue to read the Talmuds, the Babylonian and Jerusalem Talmuds, these massive collections of ancient Jewish traditions, what you'll see is, that the debate about scripture continued into the Talmud and that books which are not in the Jewish Bible today continued to be quoted as scripture by the rabbis. Right? I'll just give you one example here. Um, it's about the book of Sirach. So the book of Sirach, which is sometimes called Ecclesiasticus, is in the Catholic Old Testament. It was originally written in Hebrew, later translated into Greek, and made it into uh, the Greek Septuagint and threw that into the Catholic Old Testament. Well, although people aren't often aware of it, the rabbis quote the book of Sirach, sometimes called Ben Sirah, as if it were scripture. Right? So I'll just give you a quote here. This is from the Babylonian Talmud, tractate Hagigah, uh, Hagigah 13a, and it says this. This is one of the rabbis, about between, somewhere between 300 and 500 AD, writes, quote, So it is written, that's the standard introduction for quoting scripture, So it is written, in the book of Ben Sirah, quote, Seek not the things that are too hard for thee, search out not things that are hidden from thee. Babylonian Talmud, Haggigah 13a, and that's quoting Sirach chapter 3, verse 21 to 22. Even more striking, perhaps, is the fact that the Jerusalem Talmud, a little bit later Talmud, goes on to state in one of its treatises that the book of Sirach is actually among the writings, the Ketuvim, the third part of the scriptures. So that's an explicit uh, acknowledgement of Sirach as canonical scripture in the Jerusalem Talmud. And you can go see Lehman's book, The Canonization of the Hebrew Scriptures, page 97, for that reference from the Jerusalem Talmud. So why does that matter? Well, it's very simple. If by the time you get to the Talmuds, the rabbis are still quoting Sirach as scripture, it makes it absolutely obvious that there was no definitive or closed canon of scripture in the first century AD. Because the rabbis in the Talmuds are writing in the third, fourth, and fifth centuries AD, right? So all this goes to show that um, the evidence doesn't support the theory of the Council of Jamnia. The evidence from the Talmud shows that debate among the rabbis continued. And it points out the fact that the canon of scripture, the Bible as we have it, was not something that existed as a closed canon in the first century AD. And uh, the Council of Jamnia certainly did not close it. it was, that was something that took decades, took centuries actually, to be formed and to finally come into being so that by the time you get into the rabbinic and later rabbinic and medieval periods, uh, the Jews and the rabbis are going to settle on the 24 books of what is now today known as the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, and which will later go on to be the basis of the Protestant Old Testament of 39 books. But rooted in the Council of Jamnia, these books were not. Um, there just was no such council.
All right, so I hope that helps to give you a little insight into the Council of Jamnia. One of the reasons I did this is because um, I think that this mythical council often plays a role, uh, an, an, an unfortunate role, in debates about the origin of the Bible, uh, where you'll sometimes have Protestant apologists say, oh, well, our Old Testament, the shorter Old Testament, goes back to the Council of Jamnia in the first century AD as a kind of defense for the authority of the shorter version of the Old Testament. And the reality of the situation is the question of the canon of the Old Testament uh, simply can't be decided by that, not least because Jamnia didn't happen, right? That's the first point. But also because from a Christian perspective, the canon of the New Testament and the Old Testament isn't rooted in the authority, it can't be rooted in the authority of Jewish rabbis making a decision um, 60 years after the death of Christ, right? Um, even, let's say for the sake of argument, even if Jamnia had happened, which it didn't, right? That still would not settle the debate between Catholics and Protestants about whether there should be 46 books in the Old Testament or whether there should be 39 books in the Old Testament. That decision has to be rooted in some other authority than these rabbis and uh, than the later rabbis, the post-Christian rabbinic era. Because as the uh, New Testament makes clear, the leaders of the Jewish people after the coming of Christ and the establishment of the church and the leadership and authority being given to the apostles, those later Jewish rabbis have no authority for disciples of Jesus. So the question then becomes, where is the authority? Who has the authority to decide which books are inspired scripture in the Old Testament and, for that matter, which books are inspired scripture in the New Testament? And for that matter, you will have to look to the church founded by the apostles uh, instituted by Jesus himself. So if you want more on that and how the church made actually did have councils making definitive decisions about which books go in the Old Testament and which books are the New Testament, I'd invite you to take a look at my CD series, The Origin of the Bible, Human Invention or Divine Intervention. And there I actually take about four or five hours to walk through the evidence for how we got the Old Testament and how we got the New Testament and the role that the apostles their successors, the bishops, and actual councils of the early Catholic Church is what gave us not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well.